in chapter 4. gives a warning, and actually through the whole book, he's warning uh, the people of God, and he's telling them judgment is coming, that God's judgment, he's, going to, he's not going to turn away from His punishment because of how the people have lived so violently, and they've lived also following idols, and they've lived disrespecting <laughs> each other and disrespecting God, they lived this way. And because of that, God raised up the prophet Amos in the Old Testament. Now, the book is quite a read if you take time to read through it. But in chapter 4, there's a very interesting passage here. He says in verse 12, now let me read 11. I overthrew some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And we know how He did that. Okay? It's the fire. Amos believed in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah was a true story. The prophet believed that. As God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and you were like a firebrand plucked from the burning Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Okay. Now what he's saying is, even though all of these judgments God had sent upon His people, plagues and you know ju judgments against them and upon them punishment for their sins, just like He had sent judgments on Sodom and Gomorrah, yet they did not repent of their sins. And actually in the book of Revelation, the same sort of thing happens. Now, he says in verse 12, Amos 4.12, and probably out of all the writings of Amos, we ought to get this one, this part of this verse in our mind. Therefore, thus will I do to you, O Israel, because I, I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. So he's told them over and over again, I have judged you, you haven't listened. I have judged you, you haven't listened. I have judged you, you haven't listened. You, you've lived in rebellion and idolatry and violence. And you're not listening. So therefore, prepare to meet God. It's a powerful statement of warning. He says in verse 13, Behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind, who makes the uh, who declares to man what his thought is. That's a powerful statement. The God who declares to man what he's thinking. That's our God. God knows your, our thoughts and He can declare them to us. Jesus said that we would be judged according to every idol word that's spoken. And that our sins, like idolatry and adultery and fornications and all of these sins, are sins that come out of the heart of man. They're not just actions that we do or that people are guilty of, but they're sins that have come from the heart, from within a man. And these are what make a man unclean. That's what Jesus taught. So the prophets go back and He says, the God who formed the mountain created the wind and He declares to man what His thoughts are and makes the morning dark who treads the high places of the earth. The Lord God of hosts is His name. In other words, this is the God that's bringing this tremendous judgment. Prepare to meet Him. Now, as we uh, look at the whole idea that Jesus is coming, okay, we have to think seriously in the terms of we're going to meet Him one way or the other. We're going to all meet Him one way or the other. Whether you believe in Him or not, you're going to meet Him one day. 
whether you've lived for Him or not, you're going to meet Him one day. Whether you've been a serious Christian or a careless Christian, you're going to meet Him one day. And so John's message, Behold, He is coming, is a message of warning. When you think about the judgments that are written in the book, and the first thing He does is then He turns around and sends the messages to the churches and tells the churches, basically, all of you need to repent. There was one exception to that. But out of those seven churches, He basically told them all, you better repent because judgment's coming. And so He said it first to the church. First. Then, the church is going to their reward or non-reward. And then, chapter 14, all the way to the end of the book, you see God judging an earth that has historically rejected the true and living God. And so the judgments come throughout history upon the world. Basically, that's the book of Revelation. There's a lot of visions, a lot of things we wonder exactly what it meant, but basically that's the message through the whole book. But here John is, prepare to meet your God. I learned this verse actually at a funeral. A funeral of a, a, a drunken man. A man who died as an alcoholic. Out in the cold at night, he froze to death. And we went to his funeral. And the pastor who knew him, and probably most people in the church knew him, and basically said, he's already preached his own funeral. Prepare to meet God. And he used this verse. And that's how I learned Amos 4.12. It was from that sad situation in that man's life. And friends, listen. You do not want at the end of your life it to be a sad situation. Prepare to meet God. Some go out sooner some go out later. But they all meet God. We have to be prepared for it. The Bible's told us how to be prepared. He is coming. It's a certain coming. Jesus even said to His disciples, He said uh, in John 14, and we've already studied that wonderful passage in John 14, and how beautiful are these words of Jesus. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions, many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. In the midst of that great promise, Jesus is saying, I am coming again to receive you to Myself, that where I am, you may be also. Where I go, you know, and the way, you know. Jesus said, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Me. Friend, if we think we can get to God any other way, you better prepare yourself. Jesus said it's only through Him. He promised it. If you had known Me, He said, you would have known My Father also. From now on, you know Him and have seen Him. John's language in, in the Gospel is very, very similar to the language here when he says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Who is, who was, and who is to come. The Almighty. The Almighty. Wow. He's going to come with clouds. You know, that little phrase there is very interesting, I think, in coming with the clouds, and we've already looked at one. But I did want to look at some that Jesus taught. You know, there's certain chapters in the Gospels that you can go to to see what did Jesus say about the last days on earth? 
What did he say about the coming, his coming and the judgments that are coming? Matthew 24 is one chapter. And Mark 13 is another chapter. So let's look at Mark 13 at a short passage there. Mark 13, 24. The Gospel of Mark. Mark 13. Related to the second coming. He also mentions, Jesus mentions here, the tribulation of those days. That's why we call the last day's events the tribulation period, the tribulation time. We believe there are seven years of tribulation. Out of those years of tribulation, half of them are the great tribulation. And they're the worst, the worst of the worst times, the last, last days, so to speak. And so we, from the time of Christ till now, we're in what, what is called the last days. So we're living in them now. But the last, last days are right at the finish line before the great judgment that's coming that we're anticipating, that we're looking for, the believer is longing for. We receive comfort in that. But there is trembling and fear for those that would face the last, last days without hope in God. In Mark 13, 24. Let's back up to 21. Yeah, let's back up to 21. If anyone says, look, here is the Christ, or look, He is there, do not believe it. False Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive. If possible, even the elect. So even those that are the closest to God. Yeah. If possible, they could be deceived. But they won't be. The elect are not going to be deceived. But there will be a lot of false Christs in the last days. We're seeing them now. In, just in my lifetime, there's been many of these. False Christs and pro false prophets. They lead people astray. They're leading them astray now. People who are following anything except the truth. They're following after false Christs and false prophets. Occasionally, they'll come right out and say that they're the Savior. You have them right here, you know. And Korea has several of them. The United States has had several of them that have come up in my lifetime. And they're... They come out as a false Christ, a false prophet. Verse 23 of Mark 13 says the response that should be taken. Take heed. Listen. Pay attention. I have told you this beforehand, before it's going to happen. Take heed. Pay attention. I'm telling you this beforehand. Verse 24. In those days after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Now that's a very serious kind of uh, judgment. Okay, The stars of heaven will fall. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. Okay, Remember, we're, we're looking at the last, last days here. Verse 26. They will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory coming in the clouds with power and glory when he will send his then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven then okay and that ah, uh, there's so much here okay to to keep in mind one one is referencing the last last days the sun's dark and the moon's not going to get its light. The stars will fall. Fall. It says, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And they're going to see Him coming in the clouds. Now, He mentioned the clouds in our text today. Okay? And the whole idea of Him coming in the clouds. There are those that are making predictions about the last days. Listen to me closely. Anyone who is predicting the time of the end is a liar. They're lying. 
Do not believe them. Also, the Scripture says there will be a shortening of days. When we go back to verse 19 in Mark 13, it says in those days there will be tribulation such as not been from the beginning of creation which God created until this time. Nor ever shall be. In other words, this period of trouble is going to be worse than the world has ever seen in all of history. That's how terrible it is. In verse 20, unless the Lord has shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. That's how bad it is. But for the elect's sake, whom He chose, He shortened those days. Now in verse 20, it talks about a shortening of days. Meaning, it's going to be a brief time of these terrible, terrible events. A brief time. Now the tribulation period is roughly calculated out as seven years. And, but the really, really difficult, difficult days of the tribulation are about three and a half. Three to three and a half years. So you see times are shortened because of how terrible. There will be those who are saved during that tribulation period, but it will be very, very difficult for them. Do not be deceived. Some people might think, well, I'll wait. Uh, I'll wait and somehow I'll be saved when I see these things are happening. Sorry, that's not going to happen. The average person will not be saved during that tribulation period. There will be people saved, but not the average people. These people will have to give their lives up entirely during that tribulation period. But the hope of the believer is not to go into these troubled times, but rather to see the Lord when He comes and to rise to meet Him. Then the earth goes into this troubled time those that are left behind. And of course, that's our big concern as believers today. What about our relatives? What about friends, people we've known who will be left behind at that time? Well, it will, for all purposes, be too late for them. 